so there are a lot of different stoves out there, and of course they all work differently. However, one common feature you might have come across are these odd little dials or numbers. Well, I wanted to find out what these numbers actually mean. And a short look into the depths of Google tells me I'm not alone. Sadly, I don't have expensive equipment or any fancy science stuff. All I have besides my stove is a pot, some water and a thermometer. But that surely didn't stop me, so here's what I did. First off, some theory. A common misbelief seems to be that any number on the stove dial corresponds to a temperature. I mean, this is also how it works with ovens, right? Well, one thing to keep in mind is that an oven is a closed system, meaning that heat and temperature can easily be regulated or calibrated. Stovetops, on the other hand, are open systems, so there is no real way to calibrate the temperature. Plus, how hot your pan gets depends on the kind of material it is made of, its shape, thickness, if it's standing on the whole thing correctly, and so on. But even more importantly, the temperature changes depending on how long you keep it on there, since you are constantly putting energy into the system. So, if we want to really figure out what the heck these numbers amount to, we have to find a different quantity to guide us. And this quantity shall be power. Actually, this is what characterizes most electric devices, and it basically tells us how much energy or heat can be transferred in how much time. Now, this heat is what's really the interesting part here for us, but unfortunately, we might have to go back a little bit into high school physics for this one. In a nutshell, we imagine that all of the heat from the stove is used to raise the temperature of whatever is in the pot. Here, C characterizes exactly the kind of material we have, M stands for the mass and delta T tells us the difference in temperature. Now, for our experiment, this means we are just going to heat up some water and measure the change of temperature over time. This way, we will be able to calculate the power of each individual stage of the stove. But unfortunately, there is one last thing I should mention. This will only be the power of exactly the one stovetop we choose, using exactly the one pot we will use. If you want to include the heat that is absorbed by your pot to figure out the raw power of your stovetop, you will have to determine the heat capacity of whatever vessel you are using. Basically, this tells you how much heat you are losing every time the temperature gets increased by one degree. But that is something for a different video. For now, I'll let you know that the heat capacity of this pot was around 0.7 kJ per Kelvin. Well, I guess that's all for the theory. Let's get to work, shall we? So I consistently try to use about half a liter of water throughout this experiment. And while it doesn't really matter too much, it should be enough to not boil early while also still being feasible to stir. Then I just put it on the stove, turned up the heat and well, time to wait. So my stove has 18 stages. It goes from 1, which is the lowest, up to 9.5 or B for boiling. For the sake of simplicity, I went in order and tried to not go over 60 degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit for you weird people out there. This was to minimize the risk of any particles starting to boil, because when that happens, the temperature stops rising and energy is put towards changing the aggregate state instead. This means you have an additional error in your already flawed measurements, and we would very much like to avoid that. Since we're talking about errors already, I should also mention that it's kind of important what you're doing in between measurements. Before you start a new run, you should make sure that the pot is cooled down and doesn't still heat up the water by itself. Additionally, you probably shouldn't use the first few seconds of your measurement, as the stove will need to boot up first, until it reaches its real output power. Of course, even then, the water doesn't perfectly receive all the energy that's coming from the stove anyways. We just kind of have to accept the fact that some energy gets wasted and the final power we calculate is probably going to be a bit lower than the real one. With that said, let's go and see the results. And there it is. These are all the measurements I did. Since my cooking thermometer only displays its values with one digit after the decimal point, I only put in the numbers where the display changed from one value to the next. 
Here you can see those numbers in order of how much time had passed since the start. But this is way too much detail. We just want to know, on average, how fast temperature was rising for each one of the different stages. Which means we want to find out the slope. So we just fit some lines through there and we end up with something already quite close to what we want. With this new info, we have found all the missing pieces of our puzzle and we can finally calculate the power. So, yeah, that's it. Not very linear, is it? What's that? Why did I do this? Now judging from what Wikipedia has to say, 2 kilowatts seem to be at least appropriate for the maximum power of this stove. Of course these values can't be taken exactly like this in any way. There are way too many sources of error and assumptions going into this. But it does give us some qualitative insight in that this graph looks kind of exponential. If we take a closer look at the previous diagram again, we can see just what this means. For example, one surprising fact I found was that the last stage is as much more effective compared to 8.5 as 8.5 is more effective than the very first stage. But even with the lower stages, this exponential curve becomes apparent. When raising the temperature around say 20 Kelvin, you would need about 10 minutes for that on my stove if you were using the fourth stage. If, on the other hand, you were going to use the second one, it would already take 25 minutes. You might ask yourself now, why don't we always just use the last stage for cooking, since it would be the fastest? And the answer to that is quite easy. Cooking isn't as simple as just putting energy into your food. Chemical reactions play a huge part here, and they often take time. Just the denaturation of proteins or caramelization alone are important processes that secretly tend to come up in most recipes involving cooking. If you were to just blast the energy your sugar needs to caramelize into your pot at once, it would definitely burn. Additionally, some ways of cooking just need different methods than others. Low temperature cooking is considered to be an art on its own and something that often results in an intensified flavor. For example, this is why pulled pork is so popular in barbecue. So, when following a recipe, don't try to outsmart the system when it calls for a low or medium heat. And that's all for now. If you've made it until the end of this video, I cannot thank you enough. This project took an enormous amount of time and effort to complete, so I'd be happy to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. If you, for whatever reason, want to try this out yourself, please do share your results. And who knows, maybe my stove is just weird. But anyways, thank you so much for watching. Please give this video a like if you enjoyed it. And why not consider subscribing? It's free and I'm still starting out. But anyways, have a great day.